All right, looks like it's um, time to, <clears throat> pardon me, get going here this morning. And uh, thanks for joining us here on the night after the big party. Uh, my name's Bern Zukowski. To my left is my uh, good colleague, Ian Whitmire. And uh, we're happy that you guys have decided to join us here today. Ian is the lead on the Configurable Apps team. So he's uh, the man behind uh, the Configurable Apps. And uh, I'm just a guy. So uh, what we're going to cover this morning is uh, we're going to just kind of start from the ground up little intro to configurable apps. Uh, then we're going to do some more details about that. Ian's going to cover some of the really cool things that you can do with those. We're going to do a quick brush on Web App Builder. I'll cover story maps, and then we'll uh, cover doing more, working with the source code, embedding, and things like that. So this is kind of like an A to Z, top to bottom, everything uh, about configurable apps. And um, yeah, configurable apps are an interesting area at Esri. They cover a broad range of topics. So these are everything from the JavaScript configurable apps. Web App Builder is considered a configurable app, as are Story Maps. Each of those is unique and does things in slightly different ways. So I think after this session, you'll have a real good idea of what that landscape is like and what Esri intends to do with uh, that landscape. All right, so the first thing about these configurable apps is that they're hosted apps that are maintained by Esri in the cloud. And uh, this is a great benefit to our users because as we make updates, as bug fixes happen, they just happen, and uh, the users just uh, um, gain the benefit of that. Uh, hosted apps, some of them do come and go. Uh, but when they go, they still stay on forever. In other words, even though you might not find them in the configurable app gallery, we continue to host them. So if there are legacy applications that continue to use those, then they won't cease to function, even if they drop off the gallery. Uh, they are designed for you, meaning our end users, and also yourself. These are part of uh, really good deliverable products that you can provide for people that you're working with. There's absolutely no programming needed to be successful with these configurable apps. There's some interesting things that your expertise can be applied to uh, on top of these, even though they're hosted and configurable. You can style them with CSS. If you know a little bit of HTML and CSS, you can do some interesting little styling with these. We'll try to show you some examples of that. And of course, the source code is available. Uh, the downside of that is you got to maintain that source code yourself. And every time there's an update, you need to install it manually and install all your changes and things like that. So typically, we recommend Stick with the hosted app unless there's prevailing reasons not to. But these are good substrates to do some pretty good custom work, too. Um, bottom line is they're the fastest and the easiest way to go from a web map into a shareable application. Now, web maps are the lingua franca of WebGIS. And um, they are a internal specification. It's not a public spec. But every development team at Esri knows what a web map is and knows how to read and write one. Uh, so it's a very important part of our ecosystem. And it really does make the ecosystem go around. So the idea is you author once, and you can use those web maps in lots of different ways. Over time, we've introduced some really cool new features on web maps, which allow the deployment of those web maps in different apps to be even more specific. So two releases ago in December, we released a concept of something called a view. And what a view is, is it uses the same, um, the same feature layers but you can hide certain fields, or you can enable or disable editing. You can take that same web map with those layers in it and present it in different ways through applications to reach a different audience. And this is really, this is pretty new, but it's also a very powerful feature that will be something you want to consider as you're building and deploying your own apps for your customers. As Ian and I always say, a great app starts with a great map, and we've seen um, some lot, lots of examples of maps that could use some improvement. Uh, but this is part of where your trade craft comes into play. Uh, so it's all about kind of a good looking map that's appealing. And we've got those smart mapping tools which guide you through the process of doing that. And that includes leveraging things like transparency, scale ranges. Some of the apps know what a bookmark is, so you can add those and use those for navigation. One of the things, and one of my pet peeves is an unconfigured pop-up. So you want to take that list of GIS attributes and turn it into a more meaningful display of information like is seen in the upper right hand. Another part of tradecraft that's involved in great apps, ultimately, is performance of the web map itself. So 
Here's an example. Uh, there was a chief data officer from one of the major cities in the United States. Very smart person, not a GIS person, or certainly not a web, Esri Web GIS person. Uh, within her organization, she found all the streets for her city, and she wanted to use that in a story map. So she added that streets layer, it was a feature layer, had you know, thousands of streets, and she couldn't figure out how to make that a performant web map, right? Obviously, that many features, there's limitations, performance, the browser gags on, on that many, even if it's coming from a service. So she didn't understand the tradecraft that needed to be applied. The ultimate solution was creating a, a tile service from the feature service and then buddying them up together and using some scale dependencies to make a really performant web map. So there's lots of stuff that happens here before we even get to configuring the app that is gonna make a big difference in terms of the app and how it's experienced. Now, speaking of experience, apps are really what completes the user experience. So you can share maps in the map viewer, but the map viewer is primarily an authoring tool. And once you author that web map and apply all that tradecraft, then you marry it with an application so that you can present the map information and the tools in that app in a meaningful way. And you configure that to reach your target audience. Uh, some of these offer some specific capabilities so you can support certain words workflows, and also workflow tasks. So where do you find uh, these? Well, the standard workflow is uh, from, the, from the map viewer. You share the map, you click that create a web app button, and then you see the create a new web app gallery. And that also includes story maps, but I'll show you an alternate workflow which we recommend for story maps in just another section or two. Uh, but these are where you can find all the configurable apps. It's also where you can launch Web App Builder. It's also where you can generate the embed code if you just want to embed a web map, although we have a, a suggestion for maybe a better way to do that now using a, an app called Minimalist. Um, but that's basically where you find these. But there are a couple of other areas. Uh, I mentioned the Story Maps website already, but we also have these things called solutions. And um, solutions are really, they're kind of industry focused and very task focused, and they're meant to help us provide a COT solution to a new user. Now, um, some of the solutions are robust and mature and work really great. Others need a little help. Uh, typically, it's just a starting point, and then our users or our um, implementation services team or you can go in and kind of modify those solutions and kind of really make them work. Um, but that's the, the gamut of where you can find these configurable apps. We're going to focus on the top two bullets and we're going to leave uh, solutions uh, mostly off the table here during this session. So let's take a quick look and just kind of underscore some of those um, capabilities here. And to do that, I'm just going to start off with a web map. So this is a nicely crafted web map. It looks pretty good. Uh, we've also done some interesting things and have at least configured the pop-ups so that they're a reasonable representation of information more than just a dump of GIS attributes. And we're leveraging some of the easy things you can do in a pop-up. Um, another thing that you also might want to consider is that if you're using a legend in your configurable apps, it works off of what's available here in the table of contents. So some of these I can go ahead and get rid of the legend. So hide it from the legend if it's something that's obvious. Not every map really needs a legend if it's a great crafted map in my opinion. Uh, but uh, the layers that you want to appear in a legend, you can make sure that they're toggled on. Otherwise, you can just go ahead and hide those. And the configurable apps work with whatever you've, you've managed to uh, save and configure here within your web map. So this is the kernel for beginning. Of course, we just go to share. Uh, you've got some choices. You can share it within an organization, just within groups. You can make it public. If you make it public, you'll get the embed in website button will become enabled. There it is. And uh, then, of course, this will take you to the create a web app gallery. And this is where you find all of the different web apps that you can work with. Ian will talk about these in a little bit in more detail. Here's the web app builder. You can start up the web app builder from there. But here's the configurable apps. And let me choose, <clears throat> I don't know, what do you want to do this morning? Um, it's not a big decision. What about Story Map Basic? Story Map Basic. OK, so let's do that. So um, you can uh, click on these. Right? You can preview what your map looks like in the application by clicking this preview button. This is how you access the source code, so this will take you out to GitHub where you can grab the source code. Or what we really want to do is we want to create a web app. So we're creating a new item. 
and uh, we need to have a unique title here, give it a summary, all that kind of stuff. I'm going to take some shortcuts here. Once we click create a web app, we've got that new item in my contents. And we've got a configuration panel. And recently, Ian and his team have spent a bunch of time kind of um, trying to harmonize these configuration panels. They're all a little bit different because each app is a little bit different. But you just kind of work your way across the top. Uh, and you can, you know, each app presents some different tools. Uh, here's color scheme, some optional tools that I can turn off and on. This is a super simple viewer, and it's really meant to highlight the map. It just gives you a little banner at the top and some very, very basic tools. So this is really one of the, one of the easiest ones. Now, um, another thing I should mention is if you're using content from the Living Atlas, there are two, well, actually three kinds of content. One type of content from the Living Atlas is, um, let's just show this here real quick. Um, is uh, free content that anybody can use and access and you don't have to be a subscriber, you don't have to have an ArcGIS online account to use. But some of the, the content does require subscriber, in other words, you need to have a login to use it, and it doesn't work with a public account. So some of those are, let's go to Earth Observations. <clears throat> so if I hover over some of these, you'll see there in the little icon, it says subscriber content. It means I need to have a login to be able to access that. The apps, almost all of them will detect this and allow you to check the box to assume authentication on behalf of the user. Now there's another type of content that's called premium content. And if we go to Living Atlas, most of those are in the demographics uh, area. What premium content is, is, See, that says premium content there. <clears throat> so that's subscriber content, but also when you use these, you incur credits as the application gets used. Credits are really minimal, uh, but uh, because we owe the underlying uh, data provisioners for some of the demographic content, that's uh, where much of this comes in. So subscription and premium content are two additional types of content. Typically, you'll find them right here in the settings for the app, and you can check the box to authenticate. So here I've um, kind of styled my app when I'm uh, happy with the changes. I go ahead and save it. And again, the configuration panel shows my latest changes, and I can go ahead and launch it and see what things look like. Easy peasy, very simple. And now let's turn it over to Ian, who will um, take a little deeper dive. Thanks, Bern. So we're going to look at um, configurable apps in a little bit more detail. We'll go through, through a few other examples um, to show what's possible uh, out of the box. <clears throat> so the main thing, um, I think, you know, if, if the room is full of developers, one of the first questions you're going to ask is, I'm writing this app, or I'm building this app. What do I want to do? Or um, Coupled with that is, who do I want to be able to do X, Y, or Z with this app? Uh, so your purpose is kind of joined to your audience. Uh, so we spent a lot of time a couple of years ago sort of categorizing the applications that we have into these buckets that are generally or loosely um, focused around a purpose. So we've got um, applications that will let you build a story map and, and tell a kind of long form narrative. We've got applications for collecting and editing data. Uh, a subset of that is going to be our crowdsource applications. We have applications for comparison between maps and layers. Uh, we have some for mapping social media. We have some for routing. Um, and then we have some that are basically a way to let you explore or um, interact with the data beyond what's available in the map viewer. And those, that last category, the explore and summarize, is going to be primarily what I'm going to focus on in this, uh, this section. Um, the main reason I'm going to focus on those is some of the apps uh, have map requirements. So if you need to provide an editing solution, you're going to have to have an editable layer in your map. Some of the other ones that the apps will detect in most cases are things like bookmarks. Um, some will require a certain attribute type, for example, numeric data. Uh, and, and then one that we'll look at in a few minutes will, um, will work based off of the filter that's authored in the map viewer. Uh, before we get into any of the actual demos that I'm going to show, um, one thing that we like to recommend is if you spend a lot of time authoring your map, authoring your applications, it's pretty important to go onto the item page of that application or that and that map. And on the Settings tab, enable Delete Protection. That's just to make sure that it's not inadvertently deleted. Um, that's kind of our public service announcement for the day. So if it's authoritative content especially, or you spend a lot of time on it, make sure it's not going to get deleted without a lot of effort. Uh, and then I'll do a quick 
demo here. So uh, Bern mentioned the solution site. Uh, this map uh, I was able to locate on the solution site. And um, this is an example of a water distribution network. Uh, in my scenario today, I think I'd like to take this map and I'm going to author a, a, a essentially a viewer application. And I think I want to offer the capabilities to show a legend. I want the end users to be able to print the map if they'd like to. And I think I'm going to let them do a search for a facility by a, by a field. Um, so you can see, um, Byrne mentioned this earlier, the, um, on the table of contents, this map has been authored with scale dependent rendering. So as I zoom in, more of the features will become apparent. This is probably um, old hat for some of you guys, but it's always worth it to mention that the, the bulk of the work, the bulk of the design considerations, the bulk of the information that you're going to pass on is built into the web map. And then that app, as Bernie mentioned, is just the, the completion of the user experience. So <clears throat> in order to turn this into an app, I'm going to click Share. I'm going to choose Create a Web App. I think in this case, um, I'm going to use the basic viewer. Um, as I click on the, the thumbnail for that, it gives me a brief synopsis. It tells me it's, um, it's an application that provides some basic tools, including print, which is what I want. And I know it, it has a legend based on the, the screenshot. And almost all of them support search. So in this case, I will just uh, give it the new item a name. So this will be my water distribution viewer. <clears throat> and as soon as I click create, it'll take me into the configuration panel for this application. Uh, ignore the French. I was testing in French the other day. <clears throat> OK, so uh, for my purposes, uh, this application by default has a lot of tools. And I want to give my end users as focused of an experience as possible. So I think the first thing I'm going to do is go to the Tools tab. And I'm just going to turn off everything that's not part of my requirements. So base map gallery, bookmarks, sharing, layer list, those are all going to go off. I'm going to leave print on because that was one of my requirements. Legend was one of my other requirements. Let me just see if there's anything else. So that's, that's everything I needed to do here. Um, the only other thing that I want to add um, for my application is when it loads, I want to provide the legend by default. So I'm going to specify the legend as the active tool. So this will kind of help orient my, my users when they launch the application. And then the, the, next, uh, the next one of my requirements was to provide the ability to search by a feature layer. So since this is a water distribution network, I don't think that my users are going to need um, the world geocoder. So I'm going to disable that. And the requirement that, um, that I'm working off of here is they want to be able to find system valves. So I'm going to enable search on the system valve layer. And then I'm going to edit the search experience for that. <clears throat> so I'll leave the name uh, as system valve. But in the placeholder, I'll give a, a, a call to action. So it would be something like search by. Um, Let's see, facility ID. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to enable suggestions. And I think probably five will be good. So that'll give feedback to the users as they start to type. And for this case, I'm going to choose to display um, and search by the same field. So we'll go with searching by that facility ID field. <clears throat> and let me save my application here. And I'll, I have the ability to launch it from this. Uh, so I'm just going to do a little bit of testing just to make sure it works kind of the way I want it to work. Uh, so I can see the tools that I have um, up on the, the header here. I've got a legend. I've got the print tool. I note that the legend loads by default. That was my wish. And then I can search for the system valve. Um, as I start to type, I get some suggestions. And then I can navigate to that location. So you can see pretty quickly I was able to honor all of my requirements. Um, with that application. So the other thing I might consider is, is changing the color theme um, to something that's more uh, applicable for water. So that's, um, that's the basic viewer. Um, the next application I want to take uh, a quick tour of is the filter application. So in this example, I've authored a web map that shows uh, tornado damage um, in the United States. Um, and I've authored a filter in, um, in the map viewer to let end users interact with this data and kind of explore it. So let's say I wanted to look at uh, injuries that were 
So I, I've set up the filter to show the Fujita scale, number of injuries, and damage in millions of dollars. So let's say I want to look at something with more injuries. I can enter that into the, the dialog, update the map, and my renderer will change. So it's pretty easy to let someone interact with the data, explore the map just by interacting with the values in the, the expression that I've authored. So how does this work? How do I, how do I create this experience? <clears throat> so in the map viewer, for the layer that I'm going to be presenting, I'm going to open up the filter. And you can see that I've authored three different expressions. So I've got uh, F scale between 0 and 5, injury count at least 25, and damage in millions at least $1 million. So the other thing that I can do here is if I want to change what's presented in the UI, uh, so here you can see it says something like Fujita scale between. Uh, maybe, my, maybe my users are more familiar with uh, F scale. So I could edit that to say F scale between. <clears throat> I can make an update to my map. And then when I refresh the application, that's not working today. It's like I'm losing the, the save button here. Well, I think my demo's busted on that one. But the idea is you would author the, the filter in the map, and then you'd be able to make changes in the map that would facilitate um, surfacing changes in the application. Um, so the configuration panel for that, um, <clears throat> it lets me provide some useful information. So by default, uh, the application will um, have a um, apply button. So here I've authored the app to, to um, say update map. I could change that to something like update filter. And I can configure the application to show different text both in the side panel and on uh, the controls. So that's an example of an app that has requirements built into the map. Uh, another case is time aware data. <clears throat> Let me refresh this. So this is our time aware application. And it's basically showing conflict in Africa organized by year. So each, each time tick shows one year of conflict. And you can see if I click on the feature, I'm uh, able to see some of the pop-up content that I've authored. Users can interact with the time slider. Uh, but let's say I wanted to make a change to this and um, put the time slider more in a centrally located place. So in order to do that, I could go back to my content and open up the configuration panel for the time aware application that I was showing. So from the item page of the application, I can re-enter that configuration panel that we saw as I was um, creating my water distribution app the first time. And in this case, I'm going to go to Options. And I'm going to, no, I need time slider options. And I'm going to put the time control in the bottom center so it's more centrally located in my application. I'll make that change. I can launch the application. <clears throat> and you can see now my time slider is more centrally located over Africa. Um, I think Bernie mentioned this earlier, but one of the things that is useful about a web map is that it's discoverable, it can be authored once, and it can be reused in different applications. So um, let's say I had um, the desire to show this same conflict map through a different lens. So instead of letting it play uh, through time animation, let's say I wanted to do some summary uh, statistics for, for the casualties. So in this case, I've used the summary viewer. <clears throat> Let me reload it. And you can see, in this case, the application itself supports client-side clustering. And <clears throat> I'm able to 
provide some statistics at the bottom. Uh, in this case, I've chosen to summarize the fatalities and show the max number of fatalities, uh, and then the total count of uh, conflicts. In this application, I could author a filter that would let me get a similar experience to what I showed in the time aware template, um, but I can just <coughs> update the filter for the year and the, um, the points on the map will, will adjust. So you can see in 1999, there was 300 or so conflicts, but if I change the year to something like 2000, there was much more conflict, much more, or, sorry, fewer conflict, but I think more fatalities. Nope, I had it backwards. So 1999 was much more, um, much more of a problematic year for conflict in Africa. So those are two examples. <clears throat> uh, so Bernie talked about authoring the map to um, provide some useful information. So this is an application uh, that we recently released. It's still in beta. It's called GeoList. So this is really good for building something like a top 10 list. Um, it's slightly different than some of the story maps in that this, uh, the data that drives this doesn't have to be curated. So if you're building a short list, you're going to go into that experience with, say, 10 or 12 locations that you want to feature. Let's say we wanted to do something like rank um, stores by number of injuries, and we didn't really have any foreknowledge of, of what the top uh, thing was going to be. You could use this application to do that. Uh, in this case, we're just using it as a simple way to explore um, countries that have, um, the, I guess, the percentage of women on the, the board of, of companies in these countries. So this is the top 10 countries uh, based on that percentage. And the content in the side panel was authored in the map pop-up. And I'll show you that pop-up in just a second. But this just lets me kind of play through the tour, and it pans the map. So the, the pop-up and the feature are shown kind of side by side. So in the map, if I go to the pop-up, you can see we've kind of achieved this through uh, a little bit of HTML in the pop-up. So one of the things we wanted to do was show the flag, for example. So we wrote, um, at, well, we wanted to show the flag, and we wanted to have the title be a little bit larger than it was by default. So in the pop-up, we applied a font size of six. And then we used a little bit of HTML to style the, the, the flag image and include it in the pop-up. So you can see the results of that here. And then, uh, so that's, that's basically creating applications based on maps. Uh, we also offer configurable apps for building things based on a group. So if you wanted to have a gallery of content, you could store that in a group. Uh, or you could do something based on a scene. And <clears throat> as I mentioned, um, content is discoverable. So this is search results uh, that I wanted to search for a scene that was um, describing refugees by country of origin. So let me open up that scene. <clears throat> So this is a scene that, uh, that I authored a while ago in a different organization. And let's say I want to take this and turn this scene-based uh, data set into an application. So I can save the scene. <clears throat> and we haven't built the creation experience into the scene viewer yet, but we're working on that in the near future. So from here, I can uh, access the item details page. Once I'm on the item page of the scene, I have access to create an application. Just like from the map viewer, from here I can uh, choose a template or I can choose web app builder. In this case, I'll choose a template. We've got four templates uh, that support um, scene-based applications. One of the newer ones is called Styler. This one is um, it's using this Calcite Maps and uh, Calcite Bootstrap framework. Uh, we have a, a map-based version of this as well that's, that's new at this release. So, um, that, that's our first uh, map-based application that uses 4x. Uh, this is the scene-based version of it. Uh, so you can see I can quickly go from, <clears throat> uh, let me change the default color here. So I can quickly go from a scene to a configured app just as easily as I can from a map to a configured app. And this is configurable. I can change the about text. I can um, 
control what's in this menu. I can control what's, um, what's the default tool that loads in the menu, just like I can with most of the um, configurable apps that are based off of maps. <clears throat> okay, so. So that was a uh, quick tour of what's available in configurable apps. I'm going to do a brief demonstration with Web App Builder. So uh, Web App Builder is slightly different in terms of the, the authoring experience. Instead of picking a pre-created application and tweaking it a little bit, you know, manipulating the variables that we've exposed, this is essentially a framework that lets you pick a theme, pick a layout, and then assemble a collection of widgets and then configure those widgets to craft your solution. And we'll do a quick demonstration of that. So in this case, let's say I had a second requirement for my, um, for my water distribution network. You know, pe some people are, are happy with the map and the application that I've provided. But in this case, they wanted to see the, the data through a different lens. And the requirement I was asked for is to show a, a count of all of the system valves in the map extent. So I'll share the map, I'll create a web app, and I'll choose the web app builder tab. I'll give the new item a name. I'll click get started. This will take me into the web app builder. Uh, if I would have chosen uh, from the scene page, if I would have chosen Web App Builder, it would take me into the 3D version of Web App Builder. Uh, so <clears throat> on the left-hand side, you can see I have a collection of themes I can choose from. Uh, lately, I've been really liking the billboard theme because it's fairly simple. Um, and I'm going to choose this layout that puts the widgets on the upper right-hand corner. I could change the, the color of it if I want to, but I'm pretty happy with it uh, the way it is. Just check, take a quick check at the map tab. Uh, this would be where I would go if I wanted to change the map or um, modify the map in some way. But where most of the work is going to be done is on the widgets tab. So similar to my first um, water distribution application, I want to keep this really simple. And by default, there's some tools that I'm going to turn off just because they don't seem relevant to my use case. So I'm going to turn off the coordinate tool, the overview map, scale bar. Uh, I think that should be enough. And then I want to add a widget that will let me do that summarization of data in the map extent. And let's see, there's a lot of widgets here. So I'll just start by typing summary. Uh, so I get two options. Um, one is information summary. The other one is just summary. Um, just looking at this, I think this one on the, uh, the summary one looks numeric in nature. So I'll try this other one first, the info summary widget. Um, let's see, I'm going to add a layer to the configuration. I'm going to choose system valve. I'll leave the label as system valve because I authored my map appropriately. And then I'm going to look at the display settings for this widget. So it looks like what I know about my map just by looking at it is most of my system valves are green. So in this widget, I'm going to change the default symbol to green. I'm going to click OK on that. I want to show the feature count because that was one of my requirements. And then um, I'm going to change the title of this to something like valve summary. So I click that. <clears throat> And then I think I'm ready to save my application and then launch it and start testing. So my simple UI loads, I've got the navigation tools that I wanted. Over on the right-hand corner, I've got my info summary widget. Uh, I can see um, there's 94 valves currently shown here. Uh, and I can interact with those valves individually. I can scroll through and find the valves that are normally closed. Uh, but let's say I want to refine that experience just a little bit. You know, this, this flat list is pretty good. Um, but let's say I want to do two things. I want to make it easier to find the, the closed valves. And I want to open that, um, that widget by default. So if I go back to the builder, on the widget um, in the lower left, there's a little button. Uh, if I click that, it will uh, open the application, or sorry, open the widget by default. And if I click the pencil, I can go back into the editor. And I think what I want to do is 
on the panel tab, I want to group the features by a field. And that field, I think, would be normally open in my case. So let's make that change. And I'll relaunch the application. And I'll just start trying to test it really quick. So requirement one, fulfilled. It opens on default. If I open my valve list, uh, so it says false and true. So that's pretty close to what I wanted. I think I could configure it so that it was a, a little bit more obvious um, with respect to that label. So let me take a quick stab at that before I turn it over to Burn. So I'd go back to the display options for that widget. Um, I'd edit to the panel. And I think I'm going to choose by renderer. And I think that'll get rid of the true false issue. <clears throat> so you can see there's a lot, a lot of options available in the web app build, builder and configurable apps. OK, so there we go. Doing it by renderer gives me the experience I wanted. So it's easy to see that in this map extent, there's three closed valves, 91 open valves. And if I change the extent, that information is refreshed uh, based on what's in the map. So the lesson here, uh, I'm sure most of you guys are already familiar with this. Um, once you have your app requirements, think about your audience, iterate on it, test it ideally, um, both yourself and then hopefully have someone else look at it just to make sure that your message is coming through. I think this is also a good example of how <clears throat> the configurable apps build on the web map. So there might be some things that you do in your web map with, in terms of fields or aliases or, or other things like that that will make it easier for you to configure these. We should also mention that there is a developer edition of Web App Builder, which allows you to create your own custom widgets. And there's a lot of people that do some really uh, pretty interesting things with that. And um, so the developer edition is there for you if you want to use your programming expertise to build custom widgets. All right, uh, segue again. We're going to head on into story maps, which um, they're the most, I think, publicly visible part of the ArcGIS ecosystem. Uh, they're wildly popular. They make a lot of our users heroes. So there's a lot of interest in building these and creating these. And they really enable people to reach a much broader audience. Um, one of the key places of resources for everything Story Maps is the Story Maps website at storymaps.arcgis.com. So it's a separate website that's, that deals specifically with Story Maps, and it has some specific tools that let you um, work uh, efficiently and effectively with Story Maps. And uh, there's lots of things, uh, or lots of resources, a showcase. Uh, there's a little wizard that you can answer some questions. It guides you to the correct story map to you. So part of it is identifying which of the eight templates that you want to use. There's tutorials, training. Uh, a key part is this thing called My Stories. We'll take a little closer look at that in just a second. But there's developer info. All this stuff is available on GitHub. The uh, story maps are actually fairly complicated when you look at the source. And part of it is because they don't just have a configuration panel. They have a builder experience. And the builder is a little wizard that guides you through the process of crafting a story map. And that's ingrained throughout the source code. So to download the source code and host it and lift the builder is uh, non-trivial, shall we say. But um, at least for me, it, uh, it would be definitely non-trivial. But uh, for you, uh, it's another option for you. Uh, but it is a little bit more uh, complicated source code than, than most of the other configurable apps. My Stories is totally cool. It is a filter that uh, kind of, <laughs> it filters for story maps from your My Contents or from the user's My Contents. So My Content is where all of the stuff is, all your items. And My Stories just picks out the story maps themselves. And it has some really cool chat tools, which are better seen rather than talked about. So um, this is the place to go, though, uh, to kind of do things. There's two workflows for building story maps. One is the map-centric approach that we've been using here. You share, create a web app, <clears throat> pardon me, the story maps, or another section in that create a new web app gallery. That said, most story maps use multiple maps. Some don't use any maps at all. Uh, so this workflow is great for some story maps where there's a one-to-one -one between a, a map and the story map app. But since most take multiple story maps, and in general, we always recommend to start at the story maps website. Identify the, the app you want to use, and then go ahead and build it. Up in the upper right-hand corner is that little wizard. 
uh, that helps uh, you or your users guide uh, them to the correct store to use, and that's what we recommend. Builders are just a, a great way to guide uh, folks through the process. Builders have help. There's no separate help documentation for story maps. It's either on the story maps website or built in to the builder experience. Um, each story map supports multiple layouts. So shown here are the three different layouts for story map series. So just with a, a toggle, you can move between bulleted, tabbed, and side accordion. So they're uh, pretty flexible and something else for you to think about as you begin to deploy these. So here I am at the Story Maps website, and I'm logged in using my ArcGIS account. Great place to go here. You can kind of take a look at the featured apps. This is one that we're featuring. We'll build one of these. Uh, this is a Story Map Cascade, which is the newest Story Map. And it's starting off with a nice little looping video here. and. Um, we kind of scroll down through or swipe up on our tablet. Uh, this is called an immersive section. So it fills the screen and then we can put text and graphics that kind of float by on it and so forth. We'll just build one of these in just a moment. Um, just some great information here. Throughout the site, you'll see this create story button and this is kind of neat. And uh, what it does is it provides a list of all the apps and it also provides a wizard called Ask the Pros which guides us to the one to use. We'll look at that in a second. Uh, here's the list of apps. Each of these apps has a learn more uh, gallery filter and also a tutorial. So these are the steps that you would take to author one of these. They're all different because each story map is a little bit different. Gallery is a great place to go to just look at various different ones. They're listed here. So if you're interested in swiping Spyglass but aren't really sure, you can check that and filter for it. And then you can experience uh, one of these uh, swipe and Spyglass applications. Uh, while I've got this open, let me show you something we'll cover in just a little bit. Um, these take an inline parameter, inline URL parameter called ampersand embed. So if I want to embed this in a website or another application, just adding that to the end will minimize the UI. So instead of getting the title and the subtitle and all the social buttons, I just have the kind of the heart and soul of the application itself. And we'll uh, do an example of that in a later se section. Uh, let's go back to the uh, Story Maps website. And uh, um, there's a blog filter and so forth. My Stories is really uh, the neatest part about the whole site. I'm going to go ahead and sort these uh, by the title. And these are all the Story Maps that I've created. So this is a filter on my content. And when I click on the title, what it does is it kind of runs a check on them and it checks all the resources that it has. This one's got, uh, see what does it have? It has one map and that map's checked out okay, meaning it's there. Use that delete protection that Ian mentioned earlier to make sure it doesn't get accidentally deleted. But I've got a bunch of images and all those seem to be there. So there, it checks them, make sure they, they're there. It's got a video, it's checked that and it's got some web pages as well. Now, can't entirely be certain whether those web pages are functioning the way they should, but at least they're listed here. So the point I'm trying to make is this is a great resource for you to go to check the health of your story maps and make sure they're up and running and they're all maintained. You can, there's a big check stories button which just checks them all and you'll get like a readout of the health of all of your story maps. I notice your, um, your uh, story maps all have really nice thumbnails also. Yes. Very, so Very few had the default. That's nice. Yeah, so a, a, a best practice, look, I got two issues here and it pops them up at the top so I know I have some issues. Um, you can also create the thumbnails here for these as well. And uh, what it does is it will actually look at the story. Sorry, I opened that one up. It'll look at the story itself and it'll try to pick a graphic from the story. So if it can find something in there, it'll pull it up and suggest that as a thumbnail. So also a really great place to add thumbnails to your story maps. Let's go ahead and build one now. Uh, let's do that create story. Again, I can pick something out from here or I can ask the pros. And I'm gonna build two here real quickly. Uh, I'm thinking about a set of places. And do I want to show photos for each location? And yes, I do. And do I want to crowdsource places from your audience? No. I know the places that I want. And uh, are they organized in the categories? Not really, uh, so that's a no. And it's guided me to the Story Map Tour. Let's launch the builder. Now, Story Map Tour is one of the oldest. It was actually the first Story Map, and it's due for a revision. Uh, when it comes to media, some Story Maps enable you to load local content. 
And this is really cool and a really great uh, practice. When you load local photos or images into your story map, the ones that support it, they're automatically optimized for the web. So they're resized and they're also reduced slightly in quality. So they're optimized for the web. So you have a performance story map and it also guarantees you don't use like a five megabyte file for a thumbnail and things like that. Um, this one does not support local images yet and uh, a great place for folks to store things is Flickr, a very popular site. The cool thing about Flickr is that it does store images at various different resolutions and uh, the builder is smart enough to know which resolutions to get. I've got an ArcGIS Labs Flickr account and you can use that uh, as, as well, ArcGIS Online Labs. I type in the username, I look up, Things have to be in an album, but once uh, you type in a username, all the albums are evident here. So, um, all right, audience participation. Do you want to do Mission Bay in San Diego, or do you want to do a hike in Joshua Tree? Oh, well, let's do Mission Bay. I, 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 just, I just thought of a reason why not to do um, uh, I was Joshua, Tree. Joshua Tree myself. Yeah, okay, Thank sorry you. about that. I, I know I blew it, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and put, choose Mission Bay. Now these photos are geotagged, and when you add geotagged photos to Flickr, there's a user setting that you need to enable. Otherwise, Flickr will get rid of the geotagged information. It's a privacy thing, so just remember that. Uh, but if you, un, if, if you enable that, then it's really simple to bake a story map. Boom, they just kind of all pop in there. By the way, this is also a trick. If you need to add geotagged photos as features to a web map, you can start this builder and forget building the story, but you end up with a web map with a layer that's all got all the features located. Now, all of them have been located. I can edit these and move them around here. One hasn't been located, and I want to use this as a title. So I need to get it in. I'm just going to select it and just drop it here in the middle of Mission Bay and click Import. Now, the reason why I decided not to use Joshua Tree is because I took a little bit of extra effort, and what I did in... Um, uh, what, what I did in my Flickr account is I added a title and I added a description. So that stuff automatically got pulled over. I also used a little inline uh, HTML to add a little link for more info about the Mission Bay. So that's the cool thing. It just works so good with, uh, with Flickr. Um, let's see, base map, change the base map a little bit. I want, uh, when a user navigates, I want a little bit of a zoom. So <clears throat> we'll apply a little zoom factor here. And I will apply that. I can change uh, other settings here, like the settings. Uh, that zoom level looks a little tight here, so let's punch her out a little bit. Uh, apply that. I can also change the, uh, the colors in the heading. I can also change the layout. Let's move things over to the right, select the layout, click apply. Uh, the other thing I want to do is I can organize these, just kind of drag and drop them. This one I want to use as a introduction which means that it won't show up on the map. It'll just be the introduction. So uh, let's go ahead and save, and let's refresh the browser, and uh, let's see what we got. So refresh it, and of course the first one is now a introduction. So there's my introduction, no place on the map, and then as we advance, we should zoom in a bit. Yep, so we zoom in a bit, and then we get the title and the description, easy peasy and all these are at the appropriate size to make for a nice performant application. Let's do one more uh, application here, and let's do Story Map Cascade since that's one of the more popular ones. So usually when I, I'm familiar with these, so I just go right to the app section, and I scroll down the find that I want. Again, there's learn more in a gallery and a tutorial if you need to know more. Let's go ahead and build uh, one of these. Cascades are a pretty cool experience, and what they enable us to do is, um, is this the, uh, sorry, uh, build things pretty quickly just by following the, the builder. Now, I've got a looping video here on Vimeo, and um, I want to make a little cascade about life at Esri. So this is kind of a, kind of a really like super millennial-like kind of out of focus kind of, you know, little looping video, just a little simple thing. And I want to use that as my kind of like my introduction here. So let's go back to that. So I'm going to enter some media, and in this case, I'm going to link to content, and we'll just paste her in there, click the checkbox, and now I've got my looping video. I need to change my title. This is Life at, um, Life at Esri, and um, um, 
Oh, see, subtitle, you wouldn't believe how great it is or something like that. Uh, so that's my uh, subtitle, and I've got an interesting uh, little introduction here. We can edit that a little bit, style it in different ways. That doesn't look so good. Let's try this. All right, that looks pretty good, so I'm off to a good start. Check the box. Move on to the next section. Now what I'd like to do is add some text, and let's uh, talk about some uh, really cool maps here, since that's what we do as GIS folks. And um, I can style the text. I'm going to add a little media. I want to add some maps in this case. Let's go to Flickr. Again, it's a great place to kind of use and store things. Um, I also can add local images to this as well. Uh, but in this case, I've got a few things organized. I've got some neat maps. I'll choose one. Um, let's go ahead and add another one in this row, another neat map. There's a neat map. Let's choose another one, hit the plus button, and add a third neat map. And now I've got them all lined up in the row. And we can add some more text maybe that talks a little bit about those. Let's uh, add an immersive section now. <clears throat> Let's do something a little more interesting. Immersive sections fill up the entire screen. And let's tell a story about Esri. And I've got some, these are actually screenshots of the Esri campus. So here's what it looked like in 1960. Whoops, I used the wrong one there. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go back there. And here's the Esri campus in 1960. We choose that and add some flyby text. And these can be positioned in the center, on the right, things like that. I can also add some additional media to that. Let's add another view of the campus. And we'll make this in 2004. Campus in 2004. And again, um, I could be embedding an app here, but I'm just kind of uh, doing this with images. Let's make the transition a swipe vertical. And let's add one more. This will be the campus in uh, current campus, campus today. And uh, let's make that transition a fade slow. And I'm um, done with that section. Let's add a map now. So another immersive section. I could add some other things in between. We're going to add media. I'm going to go ahead to ArcGIS Online. I'll go in my organization. And I'm, I could add a 3D scene. I could add all sorts of other things. I've got a map of the campus here, somewhere in here. Maybe I got rid of it. Oh, here it is, Esri Campus. And now I've got a little map in there. And uh, let's invite users to explore the campus. Now, some of the settings here, which I don't really have time to explain, are you can <clears throat> have a, a map that's disabled for interaction until a user enables it. And you can also, uh, dis that disables the swipe. So if you're on a pad, the map doesn't capture your, your mouse uh, movement. But let's just kind of leave it by default. Uh, final thing I might want to add eventually is a credit section. But let's just save what we have and take a quick look. And let's view the story. So here's my Life at Esri cascade. So we got that cool little looping video. And I'm scrolling down. There's some cool maps. Here is the campus in 1960. And remember, we had that transition, which was vertical swipe. right? So there it is. And 2004, and move forwards and backwards. And uh, then here's the next transition, which was a fade transition to the final one. And then finally, I scroll to my map. Here's the campus. I've got some tools enabled. And again, whatever we've captured in the web map is uh, here in the immersive section. And that's story maps. And let's move into our uh, final section here. So this is doing more with configurable apps. So we've covered some of the configuration capabilities. But there's a lot that you can do there. And Ian showed some really cool configurable apps that are designed to do some really specific things. Web App Builder is also a very powerful uh, platform. Configure your app by configuring widgets and assembling them. And then there's a developer. Um, Web App Builder edition, which lets you create custom widgets. But the way that these apps can really be brought to life is by leveraging in lots of other different ways as well. So you can embed them in websites. When you do embed them, you just embed them by the URL. And iframe is a standard way to do that. These days, what you want to start thinking about is using protocol relative URLs. So everything's moving towards HTTPS. Uh, so what you can do is when you embed things, instead of using the explicit, using 
using HTTP or HTTPS in the URL, use the implied, the protocol relative, which is just two slashes. So the app will appear within the context uh, at, with the appropriate uh, security. Uh, another uh, good practice is to minimize the app UI if you're intending to embed it. And I've already shown you an inline URL parameter for story maps, which lets you do that. Um, Again, minimize the UI when you're embedding your web maps. Allow some room for the app to breathe. We'll take a look at a technique uh, that helps that. Uh, story maps, we've already shown this example where we took that story map swipe and spyglass, just added ampersand embed at the end of the URL, which compressed the, uh, the top panel there and got rid of the things that we don't want when we embed. A cool technique that you can use is you can embed apps in story maps and story maps in story maps. So you can extend the functionality of uh, story maps. We'll take a look at examples. Uh, this is the time aware configurable app inside of a story map journal on the main stage. And here's an example of a story map series with that minimized uh, uh, UI that's been uh, placed on the main stage again in that story map journal. Um, when you embed a web map, uh, there's a little toggle. You can choose the different options that you want, and it, it actually uses the minimalist framework to add the controls to the map. And it's based on minimalist. So here's a tip. When you're embedding a web map, there's no way currently for you to authenticate for subscription or premium content. But since it uses minimalist, your way around that is to just configure the minimalist app. It's got the little checkbox for you to authenticate for a public user, and you can just embed that in your web page. So that's, um, uh, that's a, a different approach. And uh, this is kind of a, an interesting way to, uh, to embed maps. Uh, the app source code is all available. Again, you have to self-host it, and that means you need to install your own updates and things like that as they occur. When you do work with the app source code, you need to point it to the maps that it will work with, and that's done through a map ID. It's kind of like a social security number. Uh, our social security number identifies us uniquely. Map ID uh, identifies the map uniquely, and you'll find it in the URL of the web map when you open it, and you just kind of copy that, and you drop that into the appropriate place in the source code, and that's how you point the configurable app source to the web map that you want to use. So let's take a look at uh, some examples there. And uh, while you're getting that set up, one other thing to keep in mind, especially if you're um, going to customize a story map, uh, instead of using the map ID, you'll want to use the app ID. So uh, if your story has multiple maps, you can configure it in the builder and then download the code of the story map uh, to modify the, the UI or the behavior of it, but you can still reference that same app ID that contains the references to all your maps and all the configurations that you've set up in the builder. All right, so here's an example of an embedded web map. This is from The Telegraph, which is a UK publication. And uh, it includes an embedded web map showing President Obama's international travels. And the way it does this is it's using that time aware configurable app. And you can see that these apps are responsive, so the UX is changed a bit to fit the real estate that's been given here. And uh, this is a little tight, but it seems to work. And uh, again, that's an example of using the time aware inside of, a, uh, of an app. And if we looked at the code here, this one's a little uh, hairy. There's a lot of stuff going on in the HTML, but it's just using an iframe to embed that. Uh, this is a good uh, technique, a good practice. So here's a web map. There's not a lot of space here. They're actually using the minimalist here. The minimalist lets us add a couple of extra widgets like uh, um, um, changing the base map, some very simple things like that. But what they've done is they add a link, but when I view it in larger, it's actually using uh, you know, a different uh, configurable app with a more full-blown a user experience with a legend and some other information here. So that's an interesting technique is to uh, embed the, the smallest possible uh, incarnation of the app and web map and then uh, add a link to something different. This is a really great example. This is These guys do amazing things with our technology, the Grand Canyon Trust. And they've got a uh, you, know, you can explore trails uh, throughout the area here. And what they did for this one, they wanted to enable the viewer to look at what the hike might be. And this is Angel's Landing in Zion. And they're using the Terrain Profile configurable application. So you click on the trail, and then it generates the profile. And again, it's um, kind of um, in responsive mode. So it fits the real estate there. 
And this is what the app looks like uh, when you open it up uh, in kind of large form, but same functionality. So it all works regardless of uh, how it's done. That's just a really, uh, I think a really good example there. Nice, uh, nice work on those guys. Um, all right, earlier what we did is we created this, and I'd need to pretty this up. Best practice would be that I need to uh, change the thumbnail, description, all that stuff. I haven't done that, but this is what we created, this Annapolis Transit Access Map. I used a basic viewer to do this. I've got a legend here. I don't know, I, I think just to make this legend smaller, um, I could probably get rid of the hospitals and and maybe leave the stops and maybe get rid of the routes in the legend because they're self-evident uh, and that would prevent some scrolling here. So I might make that change. Uh, but here's an example of that embedded. And I just took the whole app and I just embedded it in this kind of little placeholder web page. And that's all been done just using this little iframe here. And I just grabbed the URL and dropped it in there. This is fixed width, so I kind of used uh, fixed width uh, or percentage width and fixed width height. And uh, I didn't use protocol relative here, I probably should have. But uh, anyway, just a simple iframe, you can look up the syntax for that. And I dropped that in here. And the one thing, if I was looking at this, I'd complain about is a lot of real estate is used up for this, and I could probably get rid of this or minimize that, or use another app that would just feature the map rather than use this one. Uh, like the minimalist would be really good for this. Uh, let's take a look at another example. This is a story map journal, which is a very popular one. And this is a story map about uh, a disease that's killing bats called white nose syndrome. So we have a nice cover, lure people into the story. And uh, we go on to the next section. And what I wanted to do with this one was I wanted to show the spread of the disease over time. So we've got that time aware configurable app, which allows that. So I've added that to the main stage. I've minimized the UI on that, so it basically fills up the main stage. I don't need a title or social here because that's already built into the map journal. And I'm leveraging the capabilities of the TimeAware application to show that time. Again, this is crafted in the web map, and the TimeAware takes advantage of what I've um, configured in the, in the web map here, and I put it on the main stage. <clears throat> Advancing, uh, this is a story map series, which has been put inside of the story map journal. And the story map series, I used this because I wanted to show the species range for each of these bats. And uh, that seemed to work out really well. It seems like a nice tight topic for this one place. And um, so that's a story map series using ampersand embed dropped on the main stage. A couple of extra things I did are you can style some things where you can find improvement. I didn't like the legend that was uh, appearing here, so I actually styled that using a little CSS. So I, 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 that's how I created this little legend here, little CSS and HTML, to drop the legend in and a nice little improvement. And um, I think that's it. Uh, yeah, I think so. So we're here to this part. Uh, anybody have any uh, questions or discussion about any of the topics that we showed here? <clears throat> I know all you guys are developers, right? And uh, um, I'm not. I used to be a great Fortran programmer, but that doesn't do much for me today. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, configurable apps, I think, are something that you can add to your portfolio of things that you can do for our users, because a lot of them still struggle to do that. And then also you can use your expertise to extend them a little bit using some inline styling, which is kind of nice. Uh, also that tradecraft that applies to building great performant web maps, which impact the applications. And then the source code is available for you as well. And don't forget the, uh, the web app builder developer edition for building custom widgets. So uh, these are easy things to lift. Uh, they're easy wins for you if you walk in, maybe a consultant to a user, you can use a couple of these, get something lifted right away, show some progress, generate some excitement, and then you can do your real work and stuff. So there's lots of ways that you can use these, and uh, I think they're, they're really a good thing yeah, to add to your portfolio. It's a great spot to kind of start the conversation. You know, here's what I can offer you today, and then kind of iterate on the requirements, um, and then charge more for the, for the actual work that you do. Question. <coughs> Okay, the licensing for these configurable apps, there's no licensing, they're, they're a built-in part of the ecosystem, there's no fees, no credits, no nothing for any of these configurable apps. The developer edition is free, but there, when you need to, uh, what's the, uh, for deployment, you need to be I a... I'm not totally sure. 
Uh, you probably have to have a developer account. Yeah, could be. We, we need to check on the developer ed, uh, the edition of the web app builder. But all these templates are free, and they don't incur any costs or anything. Free, free yes. to use, distribute, use the source code. Yeah, so every, everything we showed, I think with the exception of web app builder, is available to a public account. Uh, but with web app builder, you need at least a developer or an organization account to kind of surface the items in, in online. Question back. <clears throat> Yes. So, um, right. So, uh, ArcGIS Online has these apps that are hosted. If you're implementing ArcGIS Enterprise, which is kind of what we used to call Portal for ArcGIS, the on premises version of ArcGIS Online, these apps come with that, and you're hosting these apps from your own servers there in that, in that case. Um, and the builder experience, all that stuff is part of it. If, for the story maps that are there, all the configurable apps are there, but instead of in the cloud, they're on premises. We're working on some tools which will really make that landscape interesting because um, a lot of people want to do both. You want to back up your cloud stuff to a server next time Amazon goes south, right? Or uh, I'm, an, I'm an oil company and I want to keep all my critical business uh, information on my own servers because I want that security, I want that ownership, but I also need to put out a public site. So we're working on tools that will enable you to work with public and on-premises portals and manage the, the you know, transfer or mirroring of things back and forth between the sites. So that's something we're working on now. Right now it's a fork in the road, you decide ArcGIS Enterprise or ArcGIS Online. Any other questions? All right, thanks for uh, Thank being you. with us.